us off today. All right, can you guys hear me? Yep, we can hear you great. Okay, perfect, perfect. Uh, well, I'm Haley Crabtree. I'm an associate professor at Terra State Community College, and uh, we are a small uh, rural college in Fremont, Ohio, so we're kind of between Toledo and Cleveland, if you've ever been into this area, or near Cedar Point, if you've ever been to the amusement park. So I, I just wanted to take today and share some kind of neat things we've been doing here. Um, since we've been designated in 2017. So I'm going to go over some neat projects that we've done to try to build cybersecurity, not just for our program, our, our computer systems program, but for everybody on our campus. So the in 2017, one of our initiatives or commitments that we made was to focus on spreading the word on cybersecurity for all degree areas and not just in the academic side but also for community members and then industry professionals as well. We focused on so far this year we've for the past three years we've picked a different degree program and that's offered on our campus. These are the three that we've focused on so far. We've done hospitality, management, health information, technology, and then psychology. So how we structure our activity is each fall, when we return for the fall semester, we get together with other faculty members that might be interested in starting to incorporate some cyber activities into their lesson plans. And each fall, we try to pick a new program. And then uh, the instructors from the cyber program, myself, and then we also have one other instructor, will meet with lead faculty. We'll talk about different uh, programs, maybe how cyber is affecting their program. We usually try to collect a lot of information, such as things going on in the industry, uh, the latest and greatest in technology in their area. And then we provide that to them. They can make a decision if they want to participate that semester. And then uh, we go ahead and pick the degree program. Um, kind of, it, it's usually it's been one has stuck out or volunteered to do it. So we've picked that program for the year. Once we pick it for the year, we uh, have the faculty in that program go through the Introduction to Cybersecurity course in Cisco so that they are aware of uh, what cybersecurity is, uh, some of the concepts of cybersecurity. They usually can do that course on their own because uh, it is a pretty easy walkthrough. Uh, if you've ever, if you have a Cisco license, they do offer that free. So we've allowed them to go in and take that over the course of a couple weeks. It's usually, I think, five modules is the max, or is how many are in there. So they usually don't have a problem going through that pretty quickly. Um, once we do that, we'll actually set up times for the cyber faculty, or even we've also had students that are in the program in their second year go visit the classrooms of the uh, faculty member. And they'll present a short introduction on cybersecurity just to get the other students involved in what the program's about. And then we also talk about the actual project that they're going to complete uh, in the uh, semester. Throughout the semester, uh, we implement pieces of cybersecurity into their course. So we're not just doing one final project on cybersecurity in their area, but we're also implementing pieces of cybersecurity in. So things we've done, we've done a lot of case studies where we will uh, share case studies on uh, a breach and maybe that breach affected uh, health information records. So we will do that case study together. My class will do it and her class will do it. And then uh, we kind of share resources. It's a neat way to start getting them acclimated to uh, how it's affecting their area or where their career is gonna go with that. Uh, we also, once we do create that activity, we've been sharing it in a repository. Uh, in, we have a learning management system called Canvas. I'm not sure if a lot of you have that, but there is a repository option that allows you to put all of your uh, lessons and the uh, case studies that we've done, and we post them up there for other faculty to see. 
The actual project that they complete at the end of the semester is something called poster presentations. And basically, uh, the posters are divided up into two areas. One area are students that are pursuing their cybersecurity, so that would be my students. And they usually pick, every year we try to pick a different topic in cybersecurity or something uh, kind of up and coming. Recently, we focused on big data breaches. So I have a database class that goes through this and we go through and complete, um, or we go through this project with them. The other degree areas will create a poster that focuses on cybersecurity and how it would affect their career and field today and in the future. Once we decide on when we're gonna have the project presentations, we usually schedule a time to display those. And the display is open to the community, the campus, and then also each other. So we set up a time that kind of works mutually for both of our classes. This year we did it in our cafe, which uh, we have a food service area. So we set up our posters in the back. We do send out usually invitations to our campus community, but we also will send out uh, marketing material and invitations to community members, our board members, uh, businesses that we work with on our workforce side. And just as an incentive, we also offer coffee and snacks. <laughs> so the students love it. So what do the posters look like? If we, the, po the students have two options. They can create a printed poster or a trifold poster. And I have some pictures. I'll show you what both of those look like. They also have to create a brochure or a quick guide on what they were presenting to hand out to the audience. So the audience isn't walking away from uh, their, their presentation with nothing. This would be what our printed poster looks like. It's actually a PowerPoint in PowerPoint. Um, it's one slide and it's set up for the dimensions of a poster and I'll show you what those dimensions are here in a minute. But this is an example of what our poster looks like. At the top is a gray bar and then over here we have our logo. They have to leave this gray bar and this logo here and the logo is our Terra logo and then the NSA and DOD logos too. We also then have these headers. They don't have to leave these headers here. They can move them around, but it's just kind of a starting point for them. So my particular students did a big data project. So the things they had to include on the poster were the background of the company they chose, how they were breached, how many people were affected, what the company did to solve the problem, any preventative measures they're taking, and then they had to be sure to reference any of their uh, information that they found. Um, on each poster, we do have a grading rubric, but in general, they have to at least include one picture, one chart, bulleted lists, absolutely no spelling errors because we're printing these, and then also, obviously, creativity. We're looking for them to be creative. So with our big data, we did, these are some companies or uh, breaches that we've done in the past. So we usually have them break up into groups, um, two to three per group. I don't go any more than three because, because they are doing a poster that you can print out. There's not a whole lot of cutting and pacing and gluing and coloring, uh, which a lot of my students don't like to do. So they love that we can actually design in PowerPoint and just print it out. Um, so I don't go more than two or three. These are the ones we've done. We've done the Yahoo breach, the eBay, Equifax, uh, the Heartland, Target, Uber, Anthem, Sony. Uh, recently, somebody just did the, um, the oh gosh, I just lost it. Um, anyway, it, uh, it's for Under Armour. That was one, <laughs> Under Armour. Someone just did that one too. And I usually try to pick ones that are a little bit later because they have more information. So when I requested, for example, that they, um, any preventative measures that they are taking now, a lot of that information isn't published till later on um, after they have gone through um, what they've done, how they solved it. So to pick one, that's just happened, a lot of these things they won't have answered. So I try to pick ones that are a little bit later on, or earlier on, I guess I should say. 
Um, these are some other topics we've done besides big data. We've done things like uh, we did one that was more geared towards the community. So we had posters on how to secure your password, how to secure your mobile device, how to set up a wireless network at home, the Internet of Things. And then uh, the community loved this because they could come in and actually gain some really great information and uh, take some stuff home with them as well. So what we do is I told you that we had half of the uh, present or posters were cybersecurity students and the other half were a the other degree area program that we picked. So health information records was our or health information technology was one of our uh, degree areas that we picked and this one is uh, they focused on health records and security for health information technology. We've also done we have a hospitality management program. They did hotel security, how secure is your information. Uh, one person for that particular program did one on accessing your room using your phone and how secure is that. So that's a new thing that people are able to open their uh, room or use it, their phone as their room key. Um, they also look at the life of a hacker for psychology students. So this was a little bit uh, more difficult to think how could a psychology student and a cyber student work together, but they actually did a great job on this. They actually uh, did the life of a hacker. Um, they found out the reasons why they hack. What, what's their thought process when they go through this? There also was a really good one on the new Momo that came out or whatever it was called that uh, how that affected uh, the younger generation or how that's affecting younger students. What is the schools doing about it? So on more of a, of a psychological level. Uh, other, some other general topics that uh, other programs have picked are malware and ransomware, so that affects every business in every industry, and they focus it towards their industry. Phishing attacks, uh, encryption blind spots, and this would be for uh, encrypting data moving over like a cloud network, um, which then leads into cloud threats, and then obviously the biggest threat, employees. So these are examples of, I just took snapshots of two posters. So uh, this would be the Equifax breach. And then on the right, uh, it's hard to read this one, but I think this one is the uh, US Office of Personal Management uh, when they had a breach as well. And these ones are two really good ones. They had some pictures, they always have charts. This one, both of these have references. Um, again, they all left this gray bar and logo and then kind of designed it how it best fitted their poster or their information. Uh, so where do I get them printed? I actually get them printed at Vistaprint. Um, they're uh, the cheapest that I can find. I don't know if anybody else has any other ideas or places that they use, but Vistaprint's pretty easy. They have an online uh, submission where basically I can just submit the uh, PowerPoint. It shows me what it'll look like. The ones that, um, this PowerPoint slide that uh, has the dimensions is actually a 48 by 36 poster. You can also customize that to be smaller. So if you don't want your posters as large, you can uh, do that in the Vistaprint application. But you can't, you got to make sure that you don't exceed your boundaries and that you cut off the edges. But the average cost is about 10 to $12 per poster which we've come to find out is relatively cheaper than uh, buying the trifold along with all the construction paper and printing all the material and gluing and pasting. And then not only that, we've been lucky enough to then, uh, if the student doesn't want the poster, we can keep those posters. And then we actually display them in our lab. We display them at different seminars that are available on campus. So here's an example. It, it, it's more like a gallery. So these are ones that they did the trifold. So uh, here is our cafeteria. Here they are uh, students with their brochures and people kind of walked through and they could give their presentations to the people walking through. Obviously the presentations aren't long. They're a couple of minutes long. Prior to opening it up to the community though, we do have, uh, these would be cyber students here. Um, in a second, I'll show you the, I think I did the health information technology students, but uh, they would present to each other. So they would walk through and each would get to present to each other. So not only are my students learning about cyber in a different area, um, those people are also learning general tips and things about uh, cybersecurity. Oh, here's one. This one is in our cafeteria. We also did one in our atrium. This cyber medical theft is 
uh, what this person chose to do, uh, how to secure your computer. So these are just what they look like. These are the printed ones. So you can kind of see the printed ones actually do compared to these and those, they just look so much, so great. Um, they come out great. They're relatively cheap to print. And again, like I said, this was at a summit. Uh, this was after we had the poster presentations. We were able to take these and post these around at a conference they were having on campus. And uh, everyone always is asking for these posters every year to come in and see if they can use them as a kind of background info and uh, decor. Uh, so what I've said is that we try to focus on uh, academics, right? So we're focused on bringing other degree areas in by having our students collaborate together, create uh, posters, opening it up to the community. But we've also, as a department, have tried to host events that will bring community members and industry professionals onto our campus, or we've also tried to focus on sending our professionals out. So this particular, we have, I have a couple different examples of some things we've done throughout the past three years, just to give you some ideas to maybe start something on your campus. But we did do um, one of our main events that we just hosted this year, and we hosted in, in October 2018, is the Terra State Cybersecurity Educational Initiative Summit. And we've also uh, branched out and done some public speaking. So we are guest speakers at the annual Northwest Ohio Health Information Management Association. And we also do a cybersecurity uh, seminar for our elder college. Those would be people that are 65 and older. Um, this focuses on a different age demographic. This one focuses on community. This one focuses on other professionals. The one we just recently hosted about a week ago was the annual Great Lakes Cisco Conference in 20, for 2019. This would be other fellow, our fellow faculty members that are in our region came onto our campus. And then we also do a cyberbullying program um, for Kids College, which hopefully these students would then soon to be students. So we're trying to hit different demographics, community, other professionals, different age demographic other faculty and then uh, students or uh, younger kids college. This was our, and I'm just gonna kind of give you a little description of each of these events, what we did. Um, and then I, I don't know if there's any questions, I'll have to look up here for a minute. But first event uh, we had was in October, 2018. Um, students were present at the event. So all cyber students were required to be at the event. And these students were able to network and provide also IT support for the speakers that came onto our campus. So the audience for this particular event was the community members, industry leaders, and professionals. This is kind of how the event broke out. Uh, these are the event details. We had three breakout sessions. Uh, at each session, we provided three different presentations that they could choose from. Each presentation was about 40 minutes long. We did have a dynamic speaker on our campus. We provided lunch just as an incentive to make things fun. We also invited some local high school students onto our campus and some of our Terra students to play a capture the flag event. And then we also had a company gallery. So this would be a place that had, and I'll show you some of the companies that we had on our campus. The participation was 30 high school students. Uh, we had 150 participants from the community at the summit and then nine industry professionals that presented. So our breakout, kind of to see the dynamic of who we brought on our campus and what the community was looking for, our dynamic speaker was David Kennedy from Trusted Sec. He's the CEO. He did a presentation at our lunch. And then our breakout sessions included uh, the following individuals, all from different industries, Adam Luck from IGS Energy, uh, Scott Blau from Tiffin University, Ryan Bonner from Brightline Technologies. And over here, it kind of lists their uh, their position at their company. And then here, Tara Wilson, she did National Payment Corporation, so this focused on securing your credit card payments. We also had Lauren Wagner, he is actually, um, has his PhD, and he works at a company called Centricom. He was, uh, talked about compliance. Devin Hill, he is uh, incident responder at Booz Allen Hamilton. We had, uh, Chris here, he's from Oswell Companies. He focused more on the insurance side. We also had a representative from Mike DeWine's office, and here is his name. Um, 
I'm sure I'm going to mess it up, but it's Grigory Toposky. Uh, he was a great resource to bring onto our campus because he provided some really great information on cybersecurity specifically for small businesses. So if you have a lot of small businesses in your area, we had a lot of people come on our campus to listen to these bottom two presentations. And they are, these two individuals are very interested in traveling. So if you're having an event, these might be two people that you can contact and bring onto your campus. These were some of the topics covered at those breakout sessions. So they talked about uh, corporate, uh, sorting corporate information system program, how to secure your OT in an IT world. Uh, one important thing for Ohio particularly is our defense contracts and the compliance that they have to have with NIST. So that was a great presentation for a lot of our contractors that came. We talked about reducing our cyber risk, uh, how we can create compliance programs, um, how particular um, requirements are being set up and how they affect your business related to cybersecurity how to respond to widespread breaches, risk management, and transfer, and then cybersecurity for small businesses. This is pictures of our event. So here is manufacturers extension partnerships. This is specifically Ohio's. And then we have a student here who actually, they also set up their trifold posters at this event and uh, helped facilitate it. Here's one of our speakers, Devin, and then here's some of our other companies. This would be where our gallery was, where companies could set up and provide information to our community members. Here's our dynamic speaker, David Kennedy. He was a great resource to bring on to our campus. Our students were excited um, that he was here, and he just was a very good speaker. Uh, a lot of people keep talking about it. Is he coming back again? Uh, I'm not sure yet. Our next one is going to be next, not this coming October, but the next October. So we'll work on it. One of the other ways we've been reaching out to our community is to do some speaking opportunities. Um, and I think that for us as professionals and specifically professionals in cybersecurity, it's been a great place for us to reach outside uh, people that we found want to come back to school and learn about cybersecurity just because they heard you what you talked about at an event. Um, and specifically what we've tried to do is reach out to uh, community events that are not directed for IT professionals. So some topics we've covered when we re reached out is we've covered all of these topics. So we've done we've created presentations. They can pick what kind of presentation they want. So we do who are hackers. We do one on internal and external threats, principles of security, malware, ransomware, backdoors, rootkits, what is the cloud. Uh, social engineering has been a real popular one that a lot like to do. Employees are the biggest vulnerability. Uh, we talk about how to reduce those risks. Phishing, we do an encryption one, how to prevent threats how to handle threats, and then common cloud threats. So this is just kind of give you an idea of maybe some topics that you can reach out to your community and uh, start offering these. Uh, we get hit up all the time now. We started by doing one, and now we keep getting uh, more and more every week. Sometimes we send students, uh, depending on the student, if they like to do public speaking, some don't. Um, but sometimes we'll reach the students will go out and do these and they hit all different age demographics too. We've had uh, a lot of people that have round tables at their workplace have invited us into the table. So sometimes when it's a smaller group like that, we'll send a student. Uh, we'll also have um, bigger organizations um, at your local professional organizations. We've also done some things with them as well. One of our neat events that we did to reach other faculty is we hosted the Great Lakes Cisco Conference. And this was just some things we did at the conference. It was a great, we reached out to our Cisco rep because we are an academy. I don't know if any of you are an academy, but I'm sure you've been to these conferences before. I always encourage people to volunteer to host it. It was a great event. Uh, we learned about 5G. There was automotive cybersecurity. Great examples of project-based learning, um, introduction to IoT. Packet Tracers, Python Lab, Cyber Patriot, Wireshark, Meraki, and then Layer 2 Security. One thing about our Cisco conference that was great is we had our students run it. So they also got to network with other faculty members. Obviously, the speakers that were brought on campus were professionals that provided really great information, a great networking for these students, provided free um, 
labs that they gave out free um, advice, I guess I would say, to these students. So it was a great place for them to kind of get that edge up. So I always like to talk about uh, what these things are doing for us. So I stated, and I'll go back to the beginning, the three things we're focusing on, we always have to assess it. Uh, and uh, what, since we've started doing these things the last three years, what have we seen? And so if I go back to our three areas, focusing on other degree programs, the great, great thing that we have actually uh, seen is we've seen an increase in other degree seeking individuals crossing over and taking classes from our area. So we have a um, general, uh, and they might start at a simpler class, like an A plus class and move up. Uh, they might be interested more now in networking. We've had a crossover of our electrical students coming over and taking networking classes, um, and then also taking, obviously, some of our cybersecurity uh, more related classes. Uh, community members, uh, we've had a great increase in um, contact with community members, uh, scholarship uh, opportunities, internship opportunities, because we've been reaching out and doing these events. Uh, they are coming back to us as professionals, back to us and offering opportunities for our students, which is great. We have uh, a graduating class this year and all of them, uh, I can say, have a full-time job already that they have started um, before they even graduate in IT. So it's a great thing. Um, we've never had that before. So I think this initiative that we started has really grown. And then obviously industry professionals um, bringing them on campus. They now are hosting some of their leadership conferences here on campus, as well as um, reaching out to our students to help them with certain events. We've had some people reach out and have students come on to their, and I, one in particular was a nursing home. Uh, they reached out to our students and they came in and they helped set up um, their network in their nursing home, um, which is a small thing, but it's a great way to get started, get some experience. Um, let me see, I do have some chats. Um, oh, can you see the repository of activities? Yes, I can send some out. Um, I don't think I can share my Canvas course, but I can send them to, um, I'll send them to the CAE email and then uh, Maybe she can figure out a way to send them all to you. But yeah, we have some great case studies, some great projects that we've worked on. So you can see what we've done, kind of the outline for them. And then I'll also send you the PowerPoint template that we use. And then you can just replace your logo with our, or re replace our logo with your logo. And then, like I said, it's really easy to get those printed fairly cheap as well. Um, Yeah, like I said, I will send those uh, repositories out to you. So um, does anybody have any other questions or um, thoughts? I'll, I'll keep looking at the group chat and see if anybody has anything they'd like to share. Uh, yeah, someone asked, do you have any students going to the senior citizen centers in your area? Yes, we also have a really big rehabilitation center, um, and that would host not just um, elderly, but it would also host anybody who has been in a serious accident, is going through intensive therapy. In fact, there was a younger um, student who was in his teens, and he was interested in having somebody come in and help him set up his gaming system. Um, and Unfortunately, at the center, they don't have any IT professional on staff. They just use remote IT services. So uh, some of our students went over and helped him set that up. So it was a great opportunity to uh, not only um, engage with other people, right? So we need to work on their soft skills. A lot of my students need to work on soft skills, but also a great, I, I think we were honored that they reached out and asked us to come in and they thought of us in that process. And again, I think that just came from reaching out to our community and kind of being that hub for them and creating uh, or connecting those people. Uh, my students usually, someone asked if your students get credit for such work. No, they don't. Uh, we, most, most of it's volunteer. Um, and for a lot of my students, we're on 
so we are, because we are a community college, we have a lot of older students who are coming back to school. And um, some of them are getting work assistance, so they're not able to actually do anything that is for money. Um, they're not able to get money or they, have, they can't go over a certain amount. We have some military on our campus as well. We have young students, post-secondary students, so a lot of them um, are more interested in actually getting experience. Um, and I know that sounds funny, but <laughs> or a lot of them also are working in our factories and they're coming back doing IT because they want to switch careers. Uh, so we kind of have a different a different demographic. So they are interested, most of them love to actually be able to volunteer. And it seems like a lot, but we have a lot of different classes that we pull these students from, different kinds of students. So they, they don't really have too much trouble actually finding people. Yeah, a lot of people, just, someone said I have had trouble getting students to volunteer. Um, I'll tell you one thing that we have done before in the past. So our IT department here on our campus has always asked um, or always given the opportunity for students to volunteer. So what we did is we set up a uh, volunteer program where they can put in so many hours. Um, I think it was 30 hours over the summer. And so our structure was 30 hours over the summer. And um, I think they had to be here five hours for three weeks. And so what they're basically doing is, um, basically what they're doing is uh, setting up our restructuring some of our labs. We're getting a sweep of new computers in. So they're just imaging some machines and things like that. Some things that they, they're they pretty proficient at. And so when they're done uh, with their 30 hours, they do get a review and then also a letter of recommendation. Um, So the letter of recommendation that they get is from our head of IT. So they add that to their portfolio. So it's a great way, it's kind of an incentive for them. Uh, they'll get a little certificate that they volunteered 30 hours and then they get that letter of recommendation. So I don't know if that's a thought to get uh, people onto your campus, or I'm sorry, to get uh, people to volunteer. Uh, someone said, Bachelor Fathers are aware of the questions. Um, whatever questions I answered, or I'll look at this chat here, and I will uh, kind of copy and paste and kind of let you know what I said. But uh, how do I get speakers, professionals? Um, someone asked how I get, how do you get speakers or professionals to come to your events? I actually start really early. So I start a year out asking, um, and I beg. <laughs> I'm going to be... Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Got me back. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Somebody asked me, how do you get speakers? Okay. And uh, I, I just was kind of stating that I, I go to a lot, of, I try to go to a lot of seminars. Uh, and that would be the seminars in my area, obviously the NICE conference, the NIST conferences that are available. And I collect a lot of business cards and I email and I email and I bother. Um, most individuals are, uh, actually very willing to volunteer. I, I actually had no problem getting speakers for our summit. I just started really early. And so a lot of people are excited about being able to reach out to the community. For one thing, sometimes it's business for them and it's a place for them to reach other people. And then also I, I usually provide that incentive that it's a great opportunity for my students to hear somebody of your caliber. And so they are usually very excited then once they hear that they love to actually talk to the students engage with the students um, a lot of my students ask them career advice that's also a good thing i advise them to do that and so they they have a great time actually coming and um yeah i think i just start really early i start about a year out i think i had all of those individuals a year out i also worked with the and i might get this wrong but i think it's the oc3 um the ohio national guard that's doing the cyber initiative um, 
and they also helped me get some of those speakers as well. And asked, someone asked me, do you pay these speakers or are they willing to volunteer? All of my speakers volunteered. Um, we are, again, a smaller community college. We don't usually have a ton of funding for that type of thing. And so all of them volunteer their time, their travel, everything. Um, I didn't really have to, uh, uh, we did provide thank yous and cookies and shirts and everything that we could think of. But um, other than that, they were very willing. Uh, someone said, I heard, we heard that NSA DHS speakers need to be paid. I don't know if that's true. I don't, um, I haven't had somebody specifically from the NSA come. David Kennedy is in the industry. Uh, most of my speakers were from industry, um, but reaching out to the people at uh, like the OC3 and the NICE and NIST conferences, a lot of those people are, are industry people or they also have, um, or they recommended somebody. Um, that was in the industry. Oh, you should meet so and so. So uh, that's kind of how I've gotten mine. Uh, the Cisco conference or the Cisco module, someone asked me, how do you get the Cisco modules for faculty training? Those are actually provided as a free course for a Cisco Academy. So um, they're in your, if I don't, if anybody is a Cisco Academy, that's something that you do have to apply for. You also have to have the correct faculty that can teach it. They have to go through faculty training. Um, but once it becomes, once you are academy, you have access to those free modules. And um, our faculty actually love it because it's based in all the, Cisco Academy is based in a Canvas course. So and we use Canvas learning management system. So it's really easy for them to be able to go in and uh, go through that module. You just add them as a student and then, uh, because you can add students to any of your academy courses. It's free. It's The academy isn't free, but it's free for the students, which is great because that's one less thing that they have to pay for. Um, perfect. Someone said they're going to inquire about the Cisco Academy. It's a really great resource. All usually on the academic side, you should have a rep in your area. Um, our rep primarily focuses on Northern Ohio and Southern Michigan. So if you reach out, they should be able to put you in contact with somebody that is close. And the really amazing thing about this as well is that if, I don't, if you are a CAE, and I know you've probably gone through the knowledge units, a lot of those knowledge units can be hit within the Cisco Academy uh, software, or Cisco Academy curriculum. Uh, we've used some of their activities for the knowledge unit uh, mapping. And so uh, it's a great place to start if you are looking to uh, for your CAE and your knowledge unit mapping. All right. I don't know. I don't see any. I don't think there's any more questions. Um, so if anybody doesn't have anything else, um, again, I thank you for having me and for coming to my presentation. And like I said, I'll see if I can get that information out to you guys or some way to get it out to you so I can share that with you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Haley. Um, all the resources from Haley's talk are going to be available at that link I provided earlier. For some of you guys that logged on later, you won't see it, so I'm gonna repost it again. Um, so, we're going to be starting the next round of talks at 2 p.m. Um, or 11 um, a.m. Eastern time. So um, um, feel free to stick around, or you guys can log back, or you guys can log off and log back on later. <laughs>